as I said, this is going to be really to get everyone very familiar with how franchise systems work and how our group helps people identify if the franchise is right for you or not. And then also helps you identify what might be the right one for you based on your time horizon, lifestyle goals, financial goals, uh, skill set. And most importantly to me as a consultant that's been doing this for many years now, what you're passionate about doing. I'm a big believer that you can run all the ROIs and analysis if you wake up in the morning really excited about the business that you're going to build. That's nine tenths of the game. So let's start with what is a franchise? You know, lots of people really don't clearly understand what it is. It's simply a business like any other. However, they are established. It's not a startup. They are validated. Validated means proof of concept exists. There are other open businesses and you can talk to those owners and ask them whatever you want. How's it gone for you? Did it meet your expectations? Are you making the kind of money that you expected? What's the franchisor support like? Franchisor has established systems, operating manuals. They support you with um, IT support, marketing support. Oh, let me admit another person. Charlie, welcome. We started a minute ago, so I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm discussing what franchises are all about. So the truth of the matter is that franchises are a partnership. Unlike us starting a business from scratch, this is an established brand. They know what they're doing. They provide people with a template for success. Usually franchisees that don't succeed are the ones that go to training. They learn all about how the business operates. They've talked to other owners. They go back to Houston or wherever, and they decide that they're going to be smarter than the company, and they're, they're going to change the way things are. Usually, that's a recipe for failure. In fact, only 7% of the country are military veterans. Over 16% of franchise owners in America are military veterans, and franchise companies that I talk to love it when I tell them, hey, you know, Daryl's a military veteran. The reason being that military veterans are taught and trained to follow a system. <laughs> they are trained to understand, this is what I'm supposed to do. They have a strong work ethic, generally very successful franchise owners. The other thing I wanted to discuss with everybody today is what I said about a minute ago. Most people think that franchise systems are all food. Oh, it's a Subway, a McDonald's, a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And most people don't realize that when you fill your gas tank in your car, that's a franchise. When you go to FedEx Kinko's to ship a box, that's a franchise. Same with the UPS store. And I can go on and on and on. They exist in any industry that you can possibly imagine. Our portfolio, we're a large group. We represent over 300 of the best franchise brands in the country. And I often get clients that they go, I bet you don't have anything in this field. And about 99% of the time, we do. So as you can see here, I just illustrated a few examples of, of those. Um, this next deck is an interesting one for me because it speaks to the power of franchise systems and why generally over 80% of them are still in business 10 years after they open. It's because they are established, validated. They know what they're doing. They produce, actually, this is, these are old, number, old numbers, over 20 million jobs in America. They create over $2 trillion in economic output. There are over 3,000 franchise brands. If some of you have Googled franchising, you know it can give you a migraine headache because 8 million different sites pop up. And there are over, it's closer to a million franchise establishments in the U.S. today. So this really speaks to the power of franchising in general. The Franchise MBA, as you can see on this deck, is actually a, a best-selling book that the founder of our group wrote. Um, it's a number one bestseller on Amazon. I'd be happy 
to send any of you on this call today one for free. If you want one, put it up in chat and I will mail it to you. People often ask me, so what the heck am I buying? Why do I have to pay for this, right? Well, it's pretty simple. You're buying an established asset and a partnership. So the franchisor has already created the business. They are providing you an intangible asset and a know-how on how to run the business. The road is paved for you. You have everything there. They also don't leave you because selfishly, they need you to succeed. The more you sell, the more business you do, the more business they, the more income they make because you do have to pay them uh, a, a royalty every month on your sales. So they divulge all their IP. They provide you with training, marketing support, IT, staffing support, real estate assistant, assistance, anything you need. You have a corporate office that's there to make certain that you have your best possible chance of succeeding. Okay? That's what you're buying. There's a simple example on this next deck of information that I pulled from the Franchise MBA book so that people can understand I'm a serial entrepreneur. I opened up my first business when I was 30 years old. I'm 64 years young today. I've never looked back. I hate working for anybody. I like controlling my own destiny. I like being in charge. And I feel like if I believe in myself and believe in what I'm doing, that I'll be successful. Generally, as you can see from the table that I'm showing you here, that pays off because you build real wealth and equity. It's not your typical corporate job. You get your salary, a little bonus. You get a little, you know, uh, 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 you know, pay plus next year and you're making decent money, but you're not really building any equity. So this shows you an example of the difference between entrepreneurship and just being an employee. So the question that I often ask people is, are you ready? Are you truly ready to be an owner? Are you ready to be the boss? And like a couple of you on this call already know, because you've talked to me, um, I send out a questionnaire that asks you, what do you wanna do? What industries do you like? And then I make sure that all of my clients, good consultants, and there's a big difference. There are sales organizations out there that represent six or seven brands. They're going to try to sell you one of them. If you work with consultants like our group that have hundreds of opportunities, what they make sure of is that the franchise that they present to you has a good reputation. And I will always encourage all my clients to have multiple calls to ensure that, to make sure that they feel strongly that the franchise company that they're about to partner with has a great reputation. Are the owners of the franchise of your choice satisfied? You gotta speak with them. I talked to a client last week that's emotionally excited about a franchise brand, good brand. He, does, he feels like he doesn't need to talk to other owners. Big mistake. You never know what you're gonna learn by talking to people that have been open for six months, a year, five years. So it's a very important part of the process. Um, location, location, location is everything like any business, whether it's brick and mortar or otherwise, there are certain franchise companies that will tell me, Daryl's on this call and he likes country living, small populations. The problem with franchise companies, sometimes I identify an opportunity that might be right for Daryl and they go too small, Eddie. It's too small a territory for the business to really thrive in. So they don't want you to fail. I get clients that often get mad at me when I tell them franchise company thinks it's too small because people are emotionally connected, obviously, to where they live, but they're really protecting you. If their model is not a good one for you to earn a six-figure income by building that business in your location because of demographics, they're going to tell you that. You got to make sure that you ask a lot of questions to make certain that the franchisor provides you all the assistance that you require to give you your best chance at succeeding. Like what kind of training, not only for yourself, but the people that you hire. If you want to be an absentee owner, for instance, you're going to need a general manager that reports to you. 
you're going to be working on the business and not in the business. Your computer, your phone, you're going to have to ma have a manager report to you. You want that manager well-trained by you on certain aspects as the owner, but certainly by the franchise company that knows how to operate that business. And lastly, but very importantly, honestly, look in the mirror. Do you have the time, capital, and energy required to grow your new franchise business? I often tell people that think that buying a franchise and just because they're established, they can flip a, a light switch and they're going to be successful. No, sir. No, ma'am. You have to build the business yourself. Lots of great financing for franchise businesses, unlike a startup. Um, SBA loves franchises, for example. Why? Because they're established. It's not Eddie coming in with a great idea. I need a loan. I've got this great business idea. Lenders prefer an established brand, an established business where they can dive in and look to it. So there are a lot of lending opportunities. We work with very reputable financing companies that help our clients not just tap into their liquid capital, but be able to leverage, you know, good financing. So the different types of franchise ownership. Some people want to be the owner operator. I call them the people that are the bottle washers and the cook. They want to do it all. They want a full-time job in their new franchise. So that's, you're the executive owner. You're the head cook. You're doing everything in the business. That's okay. Owner operator. Semi-absentee is you want to work in the business, maybe 10 to 15 hours a week, but you either want to keep your current job or, you know, just enjoy life and be a semi-absentee owner. And as I explained a minute ago, have a manager report to you. Absentee. This is for somebody that has more, I always like to say it, more money than time, right? They want to go fishing. I'm working with a client right now that tells me I want a business where my wife and I can take July and August off on vacation and go somewhere and make sure that I can be on top of the business with good software on my computer. That's an absentee investor. That's somebody that has to trust that he's going to hire the right GM and have the right tools to manage their business from 30,000 square feet. So it's important when you're thinking about franchise exploration to understand what kind of franchise are you interested in, but more importantly, what kind of life do you want as a new owner? This was a simple one. Again, two people on this Zoom know that when I send out the questionnaire, I also send a Myers-Briggs test. For those of you that have never taken it, it's fun. It takes a couple of minutes to fill out and it tells you who tells me who you are. When you work for a company, you kind of take on the personality of the company, right? When you own a business, you bring your personality to that business. It matters to me because personalities have a way of working better with certain franchise or certain businesses than others. So I call this one of the stones that you have to cross before you reach the other side of the river to understand what's really right for you or not is to really look in the mirror and understand who you are. How we help, how we help. When you work with somebody, with me or otherwise, make sure that that person is experienced, that they've been doing this for a while, that they are a consultant that represents hundreds of opportunities, not just a handful. Because they're, if they truly are good and professional at what they do, they're going to listen to you and they're gonna at least introduce you to opportunities that make sense to you. Determining my reputation. I have a bio on my website, ask around, whoever you're gonna work with. Try to find out who you're comfortable working with. And if they're good, they will educate you thoroughly before you make any decision. You also want a consultant. I have one that got mad at me yesterday, a client, because I had to tell him the truth, a truth he didn't wanna hear. You want a consultant that doesn't just tells you what you want to hear, like a car salesman. You want one that truly holds your hand and explains to you how things are, what might be better for you based on what you've shared with that consultant. There's a process. Ours is comprehensive. You know, there's other consultant companies that might not be as comprehensive 
as ours. The consultation call that you know one of you has already been on on this uh, Zoom. Um, we identify businesses that meet your objectives based on what you share with me. And I make sure that they have a solid rec track record and viable in your market, not only available, but viable. Um, we will introduce you to senior leadership of the companies because I don't work for these companies. I can only provide you guys with certain information. And I often tell my clients, if you really are serious and you're really interested in learning about what's best with you, you have to talk to them. They're in the trenches. All these companies are a living, breathing organism and their businesses change all the time. Talk to them. If you're serious, talk to the senior leader, leadership. Your goal, as our goal, is to create a real partnership interaction from day one. And some companies, quite honestly, if you don't interact with them and you miss a lot of calls, they will call me and tell me, you know what, Eddie, I don't think your client is right for us. I often tell people, remember, it's kind of like interviewing for a job. Franchises are awarded. So if people walk in, think, oh, well, I'm the buyer. I can, you know, behave however I want. That's not the way franchise systems work. Another service we provide for those that already have an established successful business is we help those businesses become a franchise. It's the simplest way of growing and becoming a national brand because you're using somebody else's financial and human capital to do that, not your own. So is your business ready to be a franchise? Do you wanna be a bigger national business? Uh, we work with somebody within our group who's a specialist at helping people become a franchise. It's complicated. It's complicated because all franchises are governed by the Federal Trade Commission. They are very carefully scrutinized by the FTC. You have to put together a franchise disclosure document. Lawyers got to take a look at that. You have to provide prospective new franchisees of your business with systems manuals, operations manuals, so that they can do their proper due diligence. So if you don't set yourself up well from the get-go, you're going to run into problems. But the biggest question here, if you're currently a business owner and you want to grow into a national brand, is do you want to build a big business? Do you want to become a national brand? This I also extracted from the book because it illustrates how I feel about how people should go about exploring franchises. You get on this, onto this stream, right? And you want to go to the other side. You want to make sure as you step on each stone that they're really sturdy and can hold you. Because if not, you're going to fall into the stream. Same with exploring franchises. A step at a time. Don't rush it. If you're serious about exploring franchise ownership, make sure that you go through the entire process of due diligence, exploration, talking to the company, talking to other owners, because all of us work very hard for whatever money we have. So make sure that you protect it by making sure that each one of these stones is sturdy so you can get across the river very safely. Last but not least, this is me. Been around for a while. I know what I'm doing. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that two of you on this call are people that I'm currently working with trying to help. Um, so, you know, I beat my time schedule. I thought I was gonna do half an hour. It's only been a little over 20 minutes. Um, what I wanna do now is really open up. Please unmute yourself if you have any call uh, questions whatsoever. Um, feel free, you know, to post some questions. There is, hold on, let me go into the chat room here because I know for a fact that there were some questions in the chat. Yeah, there are some questions. Um, Silvanas, I will send you the book. Charlie, the same. Resale value, Dave, good question, excellent question. Um, Dave asks, what about resale value if you want to sell your franchise? It's actually stronger than your own startup business because the franchisor 
wants you to get top value and they want a new buyer that's as strong, if not stronger than you've been. So they help you sell your franchise. You're not on your own. They then reach out to us and tells us, hey, there's a resale in Houston. Dave wants to sell his whatever business. We get on top of it. Because they're an established brand and system and are validated, their multiple tends to be strong because of all those factors. So um, even to the extent, if you buy a franchise to start with, and let's say you want to secure two territories, but obviously you only want to pay the franchise fee for the second one. You don't want to have any operating costs and you want to let it sit dormant there for a while. Let's say your first territory is doing phenomenally well. So you bought a territory in Houston and you bought one another one in College Station or wherever. Um, the first one's doing so great that you don't want to open up in College Station. Really simple. You put that franchise right back in the market and you sell it. It's that simple. Hope that helped answer your question. Do franchisers conduct physical audits to ensure you're living up to their standards? Yes. They will have monthly or quarterly calls with you. Um, a regional person might come visit you to just have a chat. At the end of the day, remember, they are, have a brand to protect and it's there to protect you. The stronger the brand, the stronger the business, but it's up to you. They're gonna let you do your thing. If you're doing well, most likely you won't hear from them. If they see monthly numbers that aren't adding up, you're gonna be getting a call from them. Robs, Daryl, Robs, on financing side, side of reach of this term get extended. Robs is nothing but you, you can use retirement funds to finance your business, whether it's a 401k or whatever. And the, the beauty of it is to me, it is the cheapest way of borrowing money because you're loaning yourself money. You just transfer a portion of retirement funding, uh, funding into your new Daryl Jameson Inc. franchising business for working capital and you name it, and it's tax-free, penalty-free, and interest-free. So that's what a Rob's is on financing slide. Retail, does the term get extended? Daryl, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand your question clearly. You have a term with a franchise, usually it's 10 years. Um, on a retail, does the term get extended? It does depending on the, the, the owner, the new owner and what the franchisor and that owner, you know, uh, discuss. So if they're qualified to have an extension of the term, the franchisor will absolutely extend it. Hope that helped. Let's see. I have some other questions here. In a semi-absentee model, does the franchisor help the franchisee with hiring a day-to-day -day manager? Yes. Again, their goal is for you to succeed. They want to make sure it's your decision who you hire, but they help find you, staff. They will work closely with you on why one person might be better than the other, but it's your business. So you hire whoever you want. They train everybody. They train you. They train your manager. They train your staff, again, to ensure that you have your absolute best chance at succeeding. Are people still looking at brick and mortar franchises? Well, they are now. They are now last year, brick and mortar, uh, for obvious reasons with the pandemic, had a bit of a struggle. Uh, our business boomed with essential service franchises. You know, people are staying home. So in our own home, we repainted our house and did a lot of renovation work around the house. Those franchises boomed. Restoration franchises boomed. There were a lot of essential service franchises that weren't brick and mortar that had a field day during the pandemic and will exit it very well. Brick and mortar, I'm starting to get more and more calls because people are realizing that as the pandemic gets behind us, there's going to be a pent up demand to go to restaurants, to get back in the gym, to really spend money on brick and mortar locations and to socially interact. So we're seeing an uptick right now in people looking 
at brick and mortar? Um, if so, what industries? If I'm looking for a specific type of franchise, help me without going through the process. Yeah, of course. You know, at the end of the day, my goal is to find you the right one. You know, I always like to say I don't have a dog in the fight on what my clients want to choose. My goal is to find them the actual one that's going to work for you based on a lot of factors. Your skill set, what you're passionate about, what's financially viable for you, what's going to give you the return on investment that you seek, what kind of franchise. So people that are looking into brick and mortar, I might ask you some deeper questions about specifically, does that mean food? Does that mean a service? Like I have a guy right now in Oklahoma that is interested in the massage business. I don't know why, but we have two excellent ones that you guys probably don't know. We don't necessarily have the known names only in our portfolio, like a massage envy. We prefer models that are as strong as possible and as supportive as possible and don't dig into our franchise pocketbooks as much as possible because of the strength of their brand. Like for example, a lot of people love Chick-fil-A. I get calls on Chick-fil-A. What about Chick-fil-A? I hear they're really inexpensive. Yeah, and they set you up. First, just try getting awarded one. It's like going to find a Pentagon job because they will ensure that you are just right for them from a religious point of view, background point of view. Do you drink? Do you? It's pretty intense but they do set you up really well. You don't have to do a thing. They open the store for you, they find your staff. From a business point of view, I hate it because it's cheap on the front end, but they take top line and bottom line. So a percentage of revenues and a percentage of your net income. So essentially you're working for them. What's the point? One McDonald's, one McDonald's franchise will set you back $1.6 million. Great brand. Household name, but that's a pretty hefty. It's going to take you a while to recoup that 1.6 mil selling burgers in one locale. Um, so the answer, Wendy, is yes. I try to provide whatever intel as a certified franchise executive I have on brands that you're considering and maybe alternative brands that might be better. Any other questions, gang? Is there an opportunity to pick up brick and mortar existing? Oh, yes. Great question, Dave. Tremendous. But they're starting to dry up. We hmm. actually, I called one of the franchise companies yesterday because I have a brick and mortar client that wants to open up a wonderful uh, organic food concept that, that I personally love because it's kind of a grab and go kind of concept. So it's a really inexpensive, really high margin and they do conversions. So it costs you a lot less money to open up that brick and mortar organic kitchen. And uh, these guys work with real estate gurus that are prowling for great discounts on, on either existing franchisees wanting to get out for whatever their good reason. And by the way, most franchisees want to get out because they either want to retire or for example, my friend Daryl on this call today might want to move from the Houston area to somewhere else in East Texas. If he has a brick and mortar operation in the Houston market, he might not want to you know, manage it from any location. He might prefer selling it and maybe opening up where he's going. So the answer to your question is yes, there's lots of opportunities right now. Uh, Chipotle, great, tremendous, very expensive high royalties, um, but very well-known brand. As you guys probably know about Chipotle over the last few years, they've hit a couple of roadblocks with issues that mm -hmm. they've had that kind of hurt their brand for a while. But um, I love Chipotle as a business model. We have two brands in our portfolio that have that same model where you walk in and it's, here's the menu, pick your greens, pick your you know, veggies, pick your proteins. It's simple, quick service. 
uh, inexpensive fast food. And the two that we represent also have outdoor dining, which Chipotle, some do, but most don't. Um, but yes, it's a good, it's a good business model, Chipotle. I just think yeah, their royalties are high. Yeah, the reason I, I ask about that is, you know, when you're part of a, a brand of family companies, you know, a problem at one can affect you, right? Even though you're not necessarily involved Correct. in it. Yeah, Correct. That's, that's some risk. Well, I can tell you, the subway is a perfect example that comes to mind to your point. They had some big issues a while back. And when you're a part of that brand, you just are infected with that issue mm -hmm. just because you're Dave who owns the subway in Houston or three yeah. of them, right? Um, so there are pluses and minuses to those big brands. I always get people that want... Oh, whether it's Chipotle or Subway or Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or, you know, the well-known brands. And there's plus and minus. Subway, for example, is an, an example of they are the world's largest franchise system with over 12,000 units. Right. So great. People know them. Household name. To really make money as a sub Subway franchisee, you got to own multiple units because a good one. And that's the owner under six figures, you know, year in. So to invest a significant amount of capital to, to maybe net yourself 80 grand a year, great, strong brand, but, you know, I, I, I want a business model. I only introduce business models to my clients that are six-figure earning opportunities. That's it. Unless I meet somebody that doesn't care. I have an older guy right now that lives in, I don't even know the name of the town in upstate New York. And he begged me, please, I need to get out of the house. My wife is driving me crazy. I've been retired for over a year and the honeydew list gets longer every day. And I can't, please, I don't need to make a lot of money. I have money saved away. I need to get out of the house, something simple. He likes pets. He loves, they own like three dogs. He wanted, do you have something in a pet arena? And boom. He's about to, you know, buy a pet franchise so he can be around the world that he loves. He gets to be out of the house. Is it a big money maker? No. Is it a very stable? Pet industry is very strong. Millennials love their pets. They spend a fortune of money on their pets and older people do too. So from a niche point of view, it's a great business. So are, are prices set uh, by the franchise or can you price any way you want? You mean pricing your services? And your products and services, yeah. Now, what, in your market, they will work very closely with you to make sure that you're competitive mm -hmm. and they'll work with you. You can't go crazy thinking, you know, the services around the country are X, you know, because they will find out. A client can do research. Remember, franchises have public information. So if you try to go higher on your pricing and your client determines, hey, I just found out that in Birmingham, I can buy this much cheaper. How come it costs so much in your market? You got to be careful with that. But franchisors are your partners. They will work closely with you on your pricing, on your marketing, on anything that you need to be successful. And I repeat myself, not out of the kindness of their heart. They want those royalty checks to come every month. They love if you did 200 grand in March, but they prefer if you do $400,000 in, in April. What happens if you can't make the royalty payment? Then you have a call with them. You know, it's like anything else. It's like not, if you don't make the mortgage payment, you know, you, you got to get in the horn to your bank or your banker is going to, you're going to be getting those letters and emails from the bank. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't make the royalty payment, They'll talk to you. They'll work with you. If you have been a good, responsive franchisee and a good partner with them, they'll work with you. And sometimes they're lenient and work out a plan with you. So they don't shut you down. They will shut you down, much like a bank. If you don't talk to them and you don't make the royalty payments, it's not like not making the mortgage payments and you don't take the calls from the bank, you're going to get a nice little foreclosure uh, uh, document, you know, mm -hmm. serve yeah. at your door any day. So, but they will work with you, you know. And uh, you have the, the the lease on the facility that's, that's totally your own? 
That's your, you own the lease. In your mm. local market, that's why I say you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. Mm. You own it. It's your lease. They're your employees. They're your everything. They, they, the, the franchise company, literally, you have to sign a franchise agreement if you decide to move forward with it. And I encourage all my clients, everyone on this call, do not be penny wise, pound foolish, like some clients I work with that tell me, ah, oh, I got a cousin who's a lawyer. And it's a young kid who's 25 years old that might do who knows what kind of law. Franchise law is very specific. There are franchise lawyers. That's all they do. Spend a couple of grand before you buy the, the, the franchise because they will walk you through all the details of questions that you're talking about, Dave, to make sure that you clearly understand. Every franchise company is different. They all have similar templates on the franchise agreements, but the bullet points are very different because they're different companies. So you want to make sure that that franchise lawyer tells you, Dave, I think you can negotiate this. This is probably not going to be negotiable. Like I work with one that I love. He's an expert. He's been a franchise lawyer for 25 years. And what I love about him is he only works with franchisees, not franchisors. He's on your side. Mm -hmm. um, Silvanas, I'm sorry. What type of franchise provide owners with 250K per annum? None. They don't provide you with anything. Franchise mm -hmm. companies provide you with the opportunity to make as much money as you can make based on your performance. I get that question asked. I actually get people sometimes to go, what's my guarantee? Zero. This is business ownership. What no, no, what? No, Eddie, what I was asking is, is that, okay, in terms of, of I guess, typical performance of, of certain types of fran franchises, what type of franchises or can or have the potential to, owe, to earn that type of revenue? As yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Yeah, because nothing, nothing, in, nothing in life is guaranteed except debt. Yes, correct. And taxes in America, for sure. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, when I work with all of you guys, one of the things that I try to determine is, what are you looking to do? How much money are you looking to make? Year one, two, and three. What is it that you want? And if you tell me, I want to earn $250,000 per year, I will focus on franchise opportunities that will give you that opportunity as soon as possible. Like I presented opportunities already to a nice gentleman on this Zoom today called Daryl. And there's a couple that I presented to him that they're, and it's public information and the franchise disclosure document that you guys actually get. If you start talking legally, they must all provide you with that document. You flip through the book and you get to an item 19. In the franchise world, it's called items. Might as well be called paragraphs. So it's item one, item two, item three. Item seven, they divulge to you in itemized format all the operating costs in line item by line item of all the open businesses. First time I saw that years ago, I was like, oh my God, I've opened multiple businesses. You have to forecast, you have to budget. With franchises, they just give it to you, literally. They also give you the revenues. So you can see the top performers are doing X amount of business. The next 25% X amount. So you, you can kind of build your own pre-income statement and try to figure it out. But to answer your question directly, if you tell me I want to make 250K per year, I look at franchise brands that are very strong and can provide you with that kind of income. The pet care service that my nice gentleman in upstate New York is about to buy you're not going to make 250k per annum, no matter how good you are. Does that did that help, Silvanas? Yes, it did. It did. There's also another way to make 250k per annum that I I kind of like the strategy, which is instead of buying a very expensive franchise with big numbers, where one territory will cost you, you know, a nice chunk of change. Find an opportunity that you love and you feel like, feel like you can build successfully in your market or multiple territories in your market that's less expensive. You leverage your staffing, you leverage your marketing, you invest less money, but because you have multiple territories, you have multiple income streams that can take you to that 250 per annum or above. So there's various ways to skin the cat. 
to get to what your income goals are. Okay. Okay. So if you open up, uh, can I just uh, ask a clarifying question on that point? Please. If you buy a franchise and let's say you open up four stores in the surrounding towns, that's only one franchise fee and you can open up as many stores as you want? That's a great question, Dave. What they do is they carve out literally in a map. So imagine Houston. Houston's one of the largest cities in America, right? So I talk to Houstonians and always go, I want something in the woodlands. The woodlands is like everyone wants to open up a business in the woodlands, right? Mm -hmm. So the woodlands, the franchise company will work closer with you and show you an exact map, literally north, south, mm -hmm. east, west. Here is your exclusive territory. No one can compete with you in this market in the woodlands, okay? Then they'll look at it, and it's all population and demographics based. Like normally, as I said before, they will tell me if Dave wants to open up in Tyler, for example. Tyler is a growing town in Texas. Small population, not a big population there. So there are certain franchise companies that look at that and go, not enough meat there for Dave to make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. So they might add Lindale and another market, and then that territory map becomes bigger. That's one territory depending on population. So to answer your question is depending on where. In Houston is a high populated city, so there's probably off the top of my head, I would say about 22 territories in Houston. So one franchise fee per territory? Yes. And you can open up multiple stores in that territory? You can open up, no. Each location, if it's a brick and mortar location, mm -hmm. each location is a territory. Because you're not going to want to open up, let's say, a Chipotle, you know, less than a mile away from each other. Right. Right. That'll be part of your franchise agreement too. The franchise companies pay a lot of attention to that. Where you open, how you open. But so one franchise fee, one store in one territory. Correct. Correct. So if you wanted to leverage by having multiple territories and say one general manager over both stores, as an example, you know, you'd have to have two territories. Yeah, but for example, I'll give you an example that happens with a lot of our franchise companies. One that I love, they are booming in the ever booming CBD business. And I've written articles on this company. We produce, we publish a magazine called the Franchise Journal. And a couple of months ago, I, I wrote an article on this company and they're a licensed distributor. They're not a franchise. So they're not beholden to a lot of the FTC guidelines, the franchises are. So their territories are bigger, right? They'll work with you. And their incentive is if you buy the Woodlands, okay? If up front you buy a second or a third, the deal is ridiculous. Like one franchise right is 40 grand. The second franchise right for the second territory is 14, one four. That's what I was trying to get to is there's opportunities to save money by buying multiple territories. I always tell all my clients, if you're excited about a business, it's a better bet to buy multiple territories up front because the discount that you get is when you do it up front. You mm -hmm. can't buy one and a year later tell them, hey, I want a, a second one and I want that discount that Eddie talked about if I buy multiple units. They're going to tell mm -hmm. you that discount was available when you bought the first one. So yeah. I always tell people that the better risk is upfront, buy two or three territories to leverage your marketing, your staffing, everything. If you don't want to open up territory two or three, they're easy to sell. The company wants it back so that they can get open. They're not making money if they're not open. And if you're sitting on the territory, not opening the business, mm -hmm. that franchise company is really excited when you call them and go, Listen, I'm not opening up in College Station. I think I'm really happy just here in the Woodlands. So it's your choice to open or not. It's your choice. You have a time set, though. They'll give people generally 12 to 18 months to open door number two after door number one. You can negotiate that. Like, obviously, during the pandemic, yeah. you know, 
franchisees had a lot of negotiating clout, right. but they'll work with you. Can you talk about non brick and mortar franchises for a moment? Uh, that would take a long time, but I'll give it, I'll try my best to give it the cliff notes version for uh, some of you on this call that are, you know, too young to know what a cliff note is. Um, I'll try to give you guys a, a shortened version of that. There are, a ton of us that we represent a big, big company and all their brands are essential service brands. They're called premium service brands. I love their company, but paint contracting, garage door design, and believe it or not, there are businesses just around garages where they come in and redo your garage, redesign your garage door. Um, there are people in essential services that whether it's roofing, in terms of home, it's anything you can imagine. Kitchen and bathroom remodeling franchises. There's concrete franchises that all they do is exterior, like driveways, pathways, both um, lawn maintenance. We have a robotic lawn uh, uh, service company that I love. They're at the forefront because they're part of a massive company in Europe that's a billion dollar company. And I didn't know, I don't know if you guys knew that over 50% of lawns in Europe are not cut by the guys that come to my house to cut the lawn, right? Mm -hmm. They're cut by eco-friendly, environmentally friendly robots. And you program the robot on a GPS on your phone. You got to set it up to your yard dimensions. And I mean, it's fascinating. I saw one physically operating, but this company and my mouth was like, oh my God, look at this thing. So that's an essential service company. Restoration, booming company, moving and storage, portable moving and storage companies, essential service. People are moving all the time. Um, but restoration, we work with a monster in that field and that's water remediation. You know, after, you know, you guys had that horrible thing happen with the winter, there was a lot of people who got flooded out, right? What do you got to do? You got to call your insurance company. That insurance company calls the local franchise holder in Houston who has a relationship with all state or state farm or whatever you get paid by the insurance company. You fix their problem with the water or mold or mildew. This one company even did COVID. They had a eco-friendly COVID cleaner. So imagine how busy an owner was going to hospitals, restaurants, facilities that needed to be COVID proof. And that's mm -hmm. a restoration business. That There are so many, Dave, in the essential services. Arena. Yeah, I like that idea because your fixed cost is low. Very. The other thing about them is they're very low cost franchises. Senior care, think about it. Last year during the pandemic, nursing homes exploded. ALFs, let's not even talk about what happened there. And then families started to look at their bank accounts going, dear God, we love, you know, mom, but I wish we could find an at home care, bring mom home, save some money. So at home senior care franchise boomed during the pandemic. And I think we'll come out of the pandemic continuing to boom. Low cost, high margin, essential service, baby boomers like me, we're not getting any younger. So the population of 65 and older is expected to grow by 32% in the next five years. Mm -hmm. That business is a built-in success. So, but I can, I could do another hour uh, Zoom with you just on essential service franchises. Okay, great. Thank you, Eddie. That, that really was uh, helpful. Okay. Anything else, guys? Well, listen. Um, no, that's it end, for me. What's that? No, I said, no, that's it for me for now. Okay. I really want to thank all of you, really, for participating in this. I hope it was helpful. I hope I helped answer your questions and enlightened you, you know, about Franchising 101 and how it truly works. Uh, my information, I'll email you guys the PowerPoint when we're done, so you can have that for future reference. All my contact information is there. So any of you that I'm not talking to currently that want my help, I'm here to help you. 
I want to thank all of you again. Good luck. Stay safe.